I was uh, disappointed to see so many people have left when I know how good this next presentation is going to be. Uh, Sandra Warren. You can't hear me? Really? Okay, I sound so loud up here. <laughs> the, um, the book title, as you may have learned out in the hall, is uh, we brought, bought a World War II bomber. It's the story untold of Michigan High School's B-17 bomber, which is the old, um, help me out here, South High School uh, and, and the Blue Ridge Parkway. Uh, Sandra has talked all over this country about this, so I think you're going to uh, enjoy this, this, uh, this experience. Let me get my notes out here. Um, Sandra was born in Grand Rapids, went to South High School, but she now lives in North Carolina, and she came all this way in this weather <laughs> to share her story with us. Uh, but um, she uh, received uh, the Michigan Historical Award for private printing category, and she has spoken, as I said, to groups all over the country and published in many different genres. Uh, so today, she's, I'm going to take just a short, not take her time up because I want you to have it. Uh, she is going to share with us uh, how she became involved in this project. Well, then I will share a little secret she shared with me. She told me that when she was in high school, writing was her worst subject. <laughs> she <laughs> apparently got that taken care of. So without ado, here is Sandra Warren. Thank you, Diane. No, I don't need that. Ah, patriotism. If ever there was a time in this country when we need some good old-fashioned patriotism, I think we'd all agree it's today. Well, today I'm going to take you back to a time when patriotism was the norm. In fact, um, certainly there were conscientious objectors during World War II, but the vast majority of Americans had family involved, and everyone was involved, and everyone wanted to do their part. And uh, that was obviously during World War II. This story, I will tell you, I, as I go along, this will make sense, but I wrote this story to tell this alumni from South High School what happened to their bomber. And uh, never in my wildest dreams did I ever uh, think that it would become such a symbol of patriotism throughout the country. There apparently has not, never been, uh, no one has ever written a story about this program, which is the Buy a Bomber program. In 1998, Tom Brokaw wrote a book that he called The Greatest Generation. And of course it was about those folks who grew up during the Great Depression and then they went on to fight in World War II, and all the people who were back on the home front, who uh, made a concerted effort to be involved and become a part of the war effort. Patriotism was very high. We had Hitler uh, marching through Europe, and we had, of course, had just had Pearl Harbor, which got us into the war, and uh, so there was a threat of the Japanese from the West Coast. And I think in today's modern, in modern today, the closest thing emotionally we can, we can come to what it must have been like with that fear of um, the emotional fear that must have uh, permeated the country then. But I think the, the closest emotional, um, emotionally that we could come to that would be how we all felt when the Twin Towers came down. We were shocked, we were horrified, we were scared, and then we got angry. And you may not know that just like in World War I and World War II, when young men changed the course of their lives, they left high schools, and they, some of them lied about their age to go fight for our country. The same thing happened after the Twin Towers came down. Um, 
there were many young men who left college, who left high school, who decided they were going to go fight for our freedom. Uh, when we think about how history records war, um, I, my microphone just fell off, excuse me. Um, when we think about how history records war, I'll just hold it. Um, they talk about the causes, the battles fought, the victories won, and the treaties signed as, as they should. Now you can't hear me? Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. When, um, when we think about how history records war, they talk about the causes, the, the battles fought, the victories won, and the treaty signed, and that's how it should be. But seldom do they talk about what was going on back at home. Now, I know there's a lot of trained researchers in the room and history buffs and probably a couple of history professors. So this is my theory. I don't know if it's true, but this is my theory. So you got to go with me here. But I think that this is the reason we, we know so much about what happened on the home front during World War II. And that's the little brownie camera, because by the 1940s, this camera had become inexpensive enough that most families could have one and they did, and they took pictures, and I believe that's why we have so much, so many pictures of what happened during, uh, during World War II. Now, war is expensive, and someone has to pay for it. So um, the selling of uh, U.S. war bonds and war stamps was a major part of how the war was paid for. In fact, the close to $3 billion cost of World War II was paid for 57% after taxes was paid for by Americans buying war bonds and war stamps. Um, the United States Treasury Department did a, got very clever in their marketing, and they put a tangible face on any amount of money that would be spent on bonds or stamps, and so you could really feel a part. They even told the children if you bought a 25 cent stamp, you would feed a carrier pigeon for a day. And of course, those of you who know World War II history know the, how important those carrier pigeons were. They carried the secret orders to the front and uh, helped the troops communicate. Well, the largest of this program was called the Buy a Bomber Program. And it basically said, if you could show proof that you had um, initiated war bond sales to the tune of $75,000, you could buy a pursuit fighter. But if you could show proof that you initiated sales of $300,000, you could buy a B-24 or a B-17. And not only could you buy it, but you could put your name on it. They'd fly it into your hometown, and you'd have a dedication ceremony. Now, I will tell you that that $300,000 uh, uh, cost varied because one book, the uh, Grand Rapids Goes to War, is a book that says that South High students raised 340000 to buy their bomber. So that, that m amount of money fluctuated up and down. Now, of course, this purchase of war bonds and war stamps wasn't an out-and-out -out sale. It was, of course, an investment made by the American people. You buy uh, the postage stamps or the stamps, and you filled a book. It cost $18.75 to fill a book, and in 10 years when it matured, you get $25. And so this was an investment into America. So a $75,000 in bonds actually physically cost financially $56,250, and likewise, $300,000 cost approximately 225000 So it wasn't uh, exactly a total, um, <clears throat> total outlay of that extra kind of money. This program began in uh, Mr. Mueller's 
at South High School in Mr. Mulder's uh, eighth grade civics class. It was weekly reader day, and um, he talked about the Biobomber program. Now, whenever you're doing research, in, you want the facts to be absolutely true if you're going to put it in a book. And I had a lot of primary sources, and primary sources are the people who lived it. So all of my primary sources said it was the weekly reader. Well, I went on a search for that weekly reader that had this story of the Biobomber program, and I couldn't find it anywhere. I had librarians looking. They scoured the Internet. They, I, bought, I went on eBay. I bought collections of weekly readers, and there was always two weeks missing, which is a very strange thing. The very two weeks I was looking for, that weekly reader was always missing. So it was a surprise to me because everyone told me Mr. Mulder read the Weekly Reader. So, um, so I write the book. It goes out in a, a year and a half, two years go by, and a gentleman contacts me from Chicago. He's looking for his bomber from Lane Tech High School. And he said to me, he said, now, now don't tell those people who lived it but I don't think it was a weekly reader. He said, I found a bulletin called Schools at War, which was uh, a bulletin that went out to every teacher in America filled with ideas of how to involve their students in the war effort. And several of them talked about the Buy a Bomber program. In fact, this October um, 1943 issue on page six is a picture of the South High School's dedication ceremony. So let's get back to South High School. Mr. Mulder reads it to his class, and sitting in the back row is little Arthur Blackport. And um, Arthur told me he was very shy, never raised his hand in class, but on that day when Mr. Mulder talked about, we could buy a bomber, wow, he raised his hand and said, Mr. Mulder, why don't we do that? And Mr. Mulder thought it was a great idea, sent him and his best friend Mel down to the principal's office. The principal uh, said, yeah, let's do that. But then the principal and Mr. Mulder got together and said, wait a minute, we, if we're talking about raising $75,000 in bond sales, we can't put this in the arms and in charge, uh, have eighth graders in charge of this. We need some older kids. So we went to the student council, and juniors Dave Dutcher and Grace Moyer came forward, and they became the co-chair, but they kept Mel and um, Arthur involved. So there were four co-chair to this campaign. They decided that their first, their first uh, well, this was their only pursuit, was they were going to try to raise $75,000 selling war bonds and war stamps, um, and they gave themselves until April 1st. They thought that would be, uh, it was about 14 weeks, and they thought that that would be a good goal to see if they could do it in, in 14 weeks. And uh, they started about late December, close to the first part of, of uh, January, and uh, kids started getting, bond sales were coming in and coming in. Now, you're probably wondering, uh, what I wondered when I really got into this was, now wait a minute, this money didn't come through the doors of South High School. The bonds were sold through the banks, so they had to convince the banks to participate and uh, keep records of the people buying bonds if they wanted to, con to give credit to the students of South High School. And it, the first, at, in the beginning, it was just two banks in the South High area. They never went to the full city for support. So um, mid-December, they started the campaign with a big assembly, got everybody excited, had this poster made, and the, the money started coming in. And after about three and a half weeks, it began to wane. You know, people get excited about things, and then they, ah, they get lackadaisical. lackadaisical. And um, so the school treasurer went to the kids and said, wait a minute, we need another assembly. We got to get these kids charged up. They're never going to make their goal on April 1st if... Uh, if they don't get on the stick. So that really got the kids going because to the astonishment of everybody, uh, two weeks later, little more than five and a half weeks into this campaign, they sh could show proof that they had initiated war bond sales and stamp sales to the tune of $75,000. Now, um, as you see up there in 
Today, by today's standards, that's one million ninety-two thousand six hundred and fifty dollars and twenty-nine cents. That's as, as of yes, uh, two days ago. That was the exchange. Um, two weeks ago, it would have been a hundred thousand dollars more. Uh, <laughs> but actually, as you can see, the actual money that had to exchange hands was eight was uh, fifty-six thousand. $250, still an awful lot of money. I always say, just think if your, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren come home and says, guess what? We're going to raise $75,000 in 12 weeks' time, and we're going to buy a... You go, yeah, right. <laughs> um, so the goal was accomplished by February 5th. That was a little more than five and a half weeks into it. And, of course, here we have, the, they named the, the pursuit fighter the Spirit of South High. And here we have the queen and her courts. You know, in high school, you can't do anything without a queen. So, um, so this is the queen and her court. Now, I have no proof that was ever painted on that pursuit fighter, nor did they ever have a dedication ceremony, because these students had given themselves until April 1st. It was only February 5th. So what do you think they thought? Wow, if we can do this in five and a half weeks' time, we ought to be able to get the big one. So they started another campaign, on, uh, set a new goal on February 14th, had a huge assembly, brought the parents in, got everybody excited about it. And to the astonishment of especially Mr. Mulder and Mr. Coriel, within two weeks' time, they had showed proof that they had initiated war bond sales of an additional $300,000, and they had their bomber. It was flown into Kent County, the old Kent County Airport, on April 6, 1943. The students, along with the feeder elementary schools, all the feeder elementary school students were invited to march from Old South High to Kent County Airport. And uh, I live in North Carolina, so I told told my brother Don, get in the car and drive from South High School to the old Kent County Airport property there, because I know it's not there anymore, and tell me how far these kids walked. And it was 1.7 miles, so it was almost two miles that they walked to get to this ceremony. And of course, they were very excited. There were over 5,000 people there. The governor, the commander of Lockbourne Air Force Base had flown in and the general in charge of the military for the United States was not able to attend, but he's the one that made this whole thing possible, and he sent a uh, telegram con uh, uh, congratulating the students for this amazing accomplishment. Well, the spirit of South High that day flew off with all the dreams of those students. I mean, this was the bomber that was going to fight the definitive battle that was going to end the war and bring our soldiers home. And uh, it flew off, and they never knew what happened to it. And every time the alumni got together, for years afterwards, the big question was, what happened to the bother? Does anybody know what happened to the bomber? And, of course, there were all kinds of stories, you know. Uh, back then, you have to realize the, there were only really four means of communication. We had, we had the newspapers, we had magazines, and uh, we had the radio, which I have no proof that they ever used the radio for this campaign. And we had the newsreels at the movies. So the kids would go to the movies, and they go, oh, did you see that report about that, that battle? I just know that was our bomber. I saw some writing on it. It had to be the spirit of South High. So there are all these mythical stories that grew up out of this era about what happened to the bomber, but nobody knew for sure. Then in 1990, Robert Truffelmeyer, who was an alumni of South High School, and he was a historian, um, and his son happens to be here today. Um, I never met his son. He just walked up and said, I'm Robert's son. So that's exciting. Uh, Robert Truff Truffelmeyer decided he was going to find out. Now, this is 1990, 47 years later. He's going to find out what happened to the bomber. So he wrote to... Uh, to the Navy, the Army Air Corps historians, and he waited and he waited and he waited, and months went by, and finally he got tired of that, so he called in the big guy, and the big guy for South High School was Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford graduated from South High School in 1931. He was captain of the football team in 1930. 
which was a champion team, I will tell you. And um, he also was a very, very loyal uh, alum alumnus. And Gerald Ford got the military on it, and the, re re excuse me, the report came back that it was used for training. <laughs> it was used for training. It never went to, it never went to war. And um, furthermore, it was dismantled in Columbus, Ohio. And so the whole, the article about uh, what Robert had accomplished was filled with how disappointed and disillusioned everyone was because their bomber didn't do the job they thought it would. Now jump to 2012. Everybody always says, how did you get involved? Well, in 1912, 1912, oh my goodness. <laughs> In 2012, um, my high school reunion, I did a history of South High School for the reunion, for the program that nobody ever listens to, you know. And um, I told many stories about South High School. There were a lot of famous people that, that uh, graduated from there. And of course, one of the stories I told was the bomber story. And this is where the bomber story ended, that it was uh, used for training and uh, was dismantled in Columbus, Ohio. Well, following that presentation, I was talking to a group of my classmates, and I said, you know, I don't know why the classmates were disillusioned and disappointed if it was used for training, even for, you know, a couple times a month for a couple years, it would have trained hundreds, maybe even close to thousands of, of, um, of young men, and they certainly would have had an effect on the war. Well, sitting, overhearing this conversation was my good friend, Joe Rogers. And he was a veteran, and he liked to do research, so he decided he was going to find the log that could tell how many pilots were trained on our bomber. Now, he could do that because you can see the tail numbers there. Uh, it actually, they leave the four off. The first two numbers are the year it was built. It was 4229577, so our bomber was built in 1942. Um, those tail numbers are like your social security number. They give information about the plane. And so that's how he was able to, to look it up. Because also in 2012, we have what we didn't have in 1990, and that's this enormous animal called the internet. So he was able to look it up. And he, he said it took him a while. He was plugging that number into everything, and all of a sudden up came a crash report. A crash report with this number on it. Now this told a very different story. Now if you, those of you who've been in the military know that when you're in the military and something happens, everyone involved has to write their, uh, where they were and what they saw and what they knew. And so in this crash report, it told the location. Um, each member of the crew had to write what their job was, what they were doing, what they knew when the plane came down. Um, and it even had the farmers who helped them when they were rescued and had a lot of information in it that, um, that normally I, I wouldn't have known or nobody would have known. So... Um, it, it said it crashed in Meadows of Dan, Virginia on October 1st, 1944 at 4.50 a.m. in the morning, and it crashed into farmer Charlie Bud Goad's pig lot. And uh, uh, Ruth Jean was one of the first ladies I interviewed from uh, Virginia, and at the end of the conversation, she said, and you know, there was debris everywhere, and all these pigs were running around, and not one pig was injured or killed. And I said, that's going in the book. <laughs> so what happened? Well, they were on a, uh, a night flight, training flight, very short, two and a half hours from Lockbourne Air Force Base to Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama. It was supposed to be two and a half hours down, a half an hour on the ground, and two and a half hours back. Well, as they were flying into uh, Montgomery, the fog started rolling in, but they were cleared for takeoff, and they took off in long, long about Chattanooga, Tennessee. The fog was so thick, they could not, they lost their way. Now, back then, the high-tech uh, navigational system was a radio direction finder, and to use the radio direction finder, you 
you needed a radio operator, which of course they had, and the the various towers across the country would beam would beam these um, you know the beeps. If you watch the old World War II movies, you'll hear the beep beep beep. Well, depending on the beep, the radio operators were trained to understand which direction they should go, whether they were going further away or closer, or whether they should turn. And um, but if you think about modern technology and weather. Uh, when a bad storm goes over, our cell phones don't work quite right, and sometimes the television doesn't work quite right. And so even today with modern technology, Mother Nature is still in charge a little bit. So back then you can imagine um, how the fog affected what they were trying to do. One of my friends said, why didn't they just fly down under the fog and land? Well, I don't know about up here anymore, but in the mountains of Virginia and in North Carolina, where I live, when the fog rolls in, it's all the way to the ground. You do not fly under anything. So um, anyway, so my friend Joe called me and said, how close do you live to Meadows of Dan, Virginia? And I said, I don't know, never heard of it. Well, it's less than three hours from my home. And so I took that as a big sign that I needed to follow up on this story. So I called the, well, you don't call Meadows of Dan, it's a crossroads. I called the Patrick County Historical Society, and a gentleman answered the phone, and I told him that I wanted information about the B-17 that crashed in Meadows of Dan, this tiny mountain community, on October 1st, 1944, and there was a big pause. And he said, oh, no, ma'am, it wasn't October, it was March, it wasn't a B-17, it was a B-24, and 11 crew members were killed. And I said, no, I'm talking about the bomber that crashed on October 1st, 1944. Uh, there were six crew members, and they all bailed out, and they were fine. And he, another pause, and he said, I'm 64 years old, I live, I've lived here my whole life, I know nothing of this story. And so talk about being a detective, a history detective, oh my goodness. So it's like, how did this happen? So I went on the radio, I did a radio interview, and I also wrote to all the newspapers in Southern Virginia asking if anyone remembered this crash and people came out of the woodwork. Um, one of the young men that came out of the woodwork was Arlie Dalton. And Arlie Dalton was a grandson of Charlie Bud Goad. And he lived with his grandpa at that time, but that particular morning he was over the mountain with some other relatives. But he, he said to me after he told me about it, um, he said, well, you know, after the war, my, uh, my grandpa sold his property to the National Park System for the Blue Ridge Parkway. I said, really? Oh my goodness. And he said, yeah, he said, you know, uh, right up until the war, the Blue Ridge Parkway was in the process of being built, and it had gone as far as Mabry's Mill. And, of course, when, the wars, when America joined the war, then all the money got diverted and, and construction stopped. So after the war, his grandpa sold the property uh, for the Blue Ridge Parkway. Now this adds another twist. Not only is, was it the Blue Ridge Parkway, but this mill called Mabry's Mill is considered the most photographed spot on the Blue Ridge Parkway. So talk about a, pl a, a place for our spirit of South High to land. Um, up here, up here in the, uh, well, I guess I have a pointer. Let me see if I can get it to work here. I don't know if you can see it. Up here is where the mill is. And there's a restaurant here now that if you're ever on the Blue Ridge in Virginia, you can see this restaurant. The uh, bombers circled the restaurant twice and landed in this field. This field, they said it, it uh, landed and, and crashed, obviously. In, um, it took up about a football-sized field uh, when, it, when it landed. So again, how did they not remember this? <laughs> It's a mystery even to the, to the folks up there. Those two big gray bear spots um, are overflow parking. So this is not far. It's like walking across the park here. It's, it's very close. You can easily walk from one to the other. And um, so that's where it came down. Now there was a six-man crew. 
These were not new pilots. They were all um, combat veterans. The four uh, first lieutenants had done their 25 missions over in, uh, out of England into Germany. They had done those. And, and during the war, if you flew 25 missions in, oh, into a enemy territory, you were allowed to um, come home. Captain Stredbeck had actually flown 52 missions out of North Africa. The names in the parentheses were the different family members of the wonderful Virginia people who came to the aid of the crew. All of the gentlemen were injured. Uh, most of them were not, were not seriously injured. They all bailed, but they bailed in mountainous territory. Uh, First Lieutenant Michael Hoban, the second from the bottom, they thought was injured the worst. He told me that uh, he never saw the ground until he hit it. And um, I think it was Captain Stredbeck told me that uh, he was floating down and all of a sudden he saw the tops of pine trees, so he braced himself. So he just hurt his foot. But the other ones, um, PFC Ralph Moore, the engineer, he... They didn't think he was that badly injured, but he ended up being in the hospital more than 90 days with internal injuries. So they were all injured, but they, they all lived through it. Here is Captain Stredbeck. At 99 years of age, uh, we, we gave him a bomber shirt, which I proudly wear, and um, we have pilot, of course, written on it, and gave him a copy of the book. Uh, a wonderful gentleman, very well, very with it, uh, unlike me today, but, <laughs> but um, he, <clears throat> he told me a lot about what happened. And he even edited the chapter on the crash to make sure I interpreted his, his notes correctly, because I don't fly planes, I don't understand all that terminology, and I'm proud to say he only changed one thing, and it was rather minor. Um, we lost him in February of uh, 2017, and uh, just two months shy of his 101st birthday, and his uh, son said he was as spry as could be right up and, and with it right up until the very end. Uh, this is uh, Lieutenant Major Michael Hoban. Uh, that, that's him kneel kneeling down with the dark hair next to the edge of the photograph of himself. And he's the one that uh, shattered his foot really bad. And he doesn't remember a whole lot of what happened on the ground because he was in shock most of the time. But uh, we just lost him in September 9, 2017 at 101 years of age. One of the stories I was told over and over that the young boys went in and they made rings out of parts of the bomber. And of course, every, everywhere I went, I would say, you know, do you have a ring? You know, somebody would tell me this, do you have a ring? And, well, I used to have one. I'll look for one. Well, on October 1st, 2015, when I did my book launch, book autograph party in Meadows of Dan uh, and told the story, this gentleman, Lavoie Bray, came up to me and he said, this belongs to you. And he handed me this beautiful, um, beautiful ring. And he said, that his friend Coy Hall made it for him and gave it to him. It is small, it does fit me. I used to wear it wherever I went, whenever I gave a talk, but I became concerned that I might lose it, so I donated it to the Patrick County Historical Society because it really belongs, it belongs to them. Um, but he said that the boys were milking, milking cows this is a farm community, and it was 4.50 a.m. They were all milking cows when they heard the bomber crash. And uh, Coy's older brothers, Luther and Benjamin, went running over to, uh, to the field to see where it, where it happened. Well, since this came down and, and this incredible story, and it's at this historic site, I just thought there should be a historical marker telling this story at Maybury's Mill, because so many people come to it every year. And um, in, on July 1st, 2015, the Blue Ridge Parkway historians sent their archaeologist and historian with a GPS and the deed to the property to verify that this indeed was their property, and they declared it a, an archaeological site. On um, 
the two gentlemen in the picture, the one in the blue plaid shirt is Arlie Dalton, and he is the grandson of Charlie Bud Gold. And he and Arlie um, Burnett met me there at the site to show me exactly where the bomber crashed. And I asked Arlie Dalton, I said, so how, does, how different does this place look than it did when 70 years ago? And he said, well, it doesn't look much different. He said the big trees around the outside are bigger, but he said it's still swamp. It's a, it's a, it's a pig lot. It's a swampy area, and there are big bunches of rhododendrons and things. And he said it really doesn't look that different. We did find a part of the bomber when we were walking through the property um, 71 years later, 72 years later, and we knew it was a, a part of the bomber because it had writing on it and it said um, USAAF, and my husband plugged it into his smartphone, and when he did, up came World War II aviation plug socket. Now, what would that be doing in a pig lot in the middle of Virginia, a tiny town in Virginia, if it didn't come from our bomber? So, um, anyways, uh, I researched how do you get a historical marker uh, placed, and in May of 2016, I sent a letter along with a book and a petition signed by over 300 people from 13 different states, which I had been collecting as I spoke, collecting names of people saying, would you support a, a marker at this location? And that was in May of 2016. In August, it was approved. In October, the site was chosen. And just October 1st, 2018, uh, the marker commemorating what the students at South High School did from Grand Rapids, Michigan, was placed on the Blue Ridge Parkway. I think that is quite extraordinary. <laughs> and we hope to get one placed at the school. Um, that's, that's the next project. Uh, at the dedication, there were over 150 people. These 15 South High alumni came down, and uh, suddenly they all had shirts on. I'm guessing that uh, Marge from Marge's Donut Den, as many of you probably recognize her right in the front row there next to me. I suspect she brought them down because I know they all didn't wear their South High memorabilia stuff, but some of them did. Anyways, it was, it was great fun to have them there. These are a lot of the, some of the people that I interviewed, the gal in the pink, uh, the pink flowered top. Uh, her father rescued Captain Stredbeck, and she was absolutely insistent that Raj and I drive around the mountain to where she lives, because behind where she lives today is the old farmhouse where her father, after the crash, went out on the porch and in the fog, heard somebody yelling and yelled captain's, um, captain's way uh, into safety. And so she, uh, that's Vera, and a couple of the other ladies, their families actually served the, uh, the soldiers breakfast that morning before they were, they were picked up and taken away. <clears throat> to the, uh, they went to Roanoke to the uh, military hospital there. I was very fortunate, like I said in the beginning, uh, when an, an author writes nonfiction, you look for primary sources, and I was very happy and very lucky to have these primary sources. Um, you can see here, there's Arthur Blackport, and he was going to try to be here today, but uh, I don't see him, so I'm sure the snow uh, stopped that. And here's David Dutcher. And uh, here we have John Reynolds. He's the, the gentleman from the Patrick County Historical Society in Vera. And this is the old farmhouse. And, of course, Captain Stredbeck, you saw him before. And here's Michael Hoban. I had the honor of meeting him. He lived in uh, Braden, Florida. And when we were in Florida, here's Arlie Burnett and Arlie Dalton. <clears throat> they met with Roger and myself and John Reynolds and showed us where the bomber came down, the exact location. And here's my friend Joe Rogers, who had um, 
if he hadn't found this crash report, there wouldn't have been a book and I wouldn't have been standing up here at all. <laughs> Trust me. I was very lucky that Dave Dutcher was a saver. You know, today the young kids throw everything away and delete everything from their computers and we wonder what kind of records we're gonna have in the future. But Dave Dutcher saved everything and the South High Tatler was the newsletter that came out every other week. And he saved all the newsletters from his junior and senior year. And therein, when I called him, he said, I have exactly what you need. He had, for one of his high school reunions, he had spiral bound all of those newsletters for his classmates for a gift. And he gave that to me. Um, obviously, it went every other week telling about how the campaign was going, who was doing what. And without this so collection of South High Tatlers, this would not have been a book. It would have been an interesting story, but it would have been a pamphlet, believe me. So I was able to tell the class of 1943 through 1948, South High School was a 7 through 12 school. And I was able to tell them that they had no longer needed to be disheartened, that they had done a phenomenal thing, uh, uh, an incredible thing. They had raised over $375,000, bought a Pursuit fighter and a, um, a B-17 bomber for the war effort. Now, you might be interested to know that by early 1944, there were over 3,000 individual planes were purchased this way. Now, this program was open to anybody, but most of the people who participated were businesses, organizations, churches, um, and churches, and um, a few school systems did it. I think I counted 10 that we know of, but um, there were only three or four individual schools that, that uh, participated and actually received the bomber. I've been told that we're one of the only schools that ever had a bomber flown into town because after a while, it just, there wasn't time. They were, they were training young men and putting them in planes, these huge bombers, and sending them off to war um, as fast as they could, and they, they didn't have time. But at that time, early 44, they were still getting requests of 300 a month. And, you know, the war went on for almost two years longer because it was late fall, early um, when the war ended in 1945. So... I was, I was thrilled to be able to tell the story um, and to share it with you today. I'm going to end with something some of you have already seen, but uh, where is it? <laughs> Do you know how to get it to go? What happens when commitment okay, and here dedication it is. intersect with patriotism Thank you. and the power of persuasion? The spirit of South High, that's what happens. 13 on your side's Brent Ashcroft is here to fully tell this long neglected piece of Grand Rapids past in our Michigan life. We had Adolf Hitler marching through Europe threatening the Atlantic coast, then Pearl Harbor threatened the Pacific coast. The winds of war were raging. Those on the home front wanted to support those fighting on the front lines. The students at Grand Rapids South High School came up with a way. They thought they bought the bomber that was going to win the war. Their attempt at history became a mystery that would take 72 years to solve. It happened near this small Virginia community where the Blue Ridge Parkway passes by Maybury's Mill. Beyond the babbling brook in this field of trees. We were there right after it hit the ground before they ever picked anything up. A warplane went down. It has been declared an archaeological site. Some locals remember it happening. Hearing the airplane go over was what woke me up. While most were unaware for decades. A lot of people still don't know the story. The story started in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It was the war years. A rare time when full-time employment collided with extreme deprivation. Everything was rationed. The students at Grand Rapids South High School saw an opportunity to help. I just felt like it was the thing to do. December 1942, eighth grade civics class. It was the weekly reader that Mr. Mulder read to the class and told them about the Buy a Bomber program. Sitting in the back row. It wouldn't ordinarily be me, but it just happened that way. 
Arthur Blackport. I raised my hand. I says, Mr. Mulder, why can't we do that? And he says, OK. Blackport and classmate Mel Hartger initiated the campaign. I never thought it would be something that big. Juniors David Dutcher and Grace Moyer joined as co-chairs. And therein started South's involvement. How could a bunch of kids afford to buy a bomber? 57% of World War II was paid for by Americans buying war bonds and war stamps. That's how. People were very willing to give, to give up what they had because the people on the home front wanted to get involved. Barbara Davidson remembers doing a lot of door knocking. We talked to all our relatives, all our neighbors. <laughs> so did Leonard Stormzand. People had money, so they all contributed. In less than three months, the students raised $375,000. They had enough to buy a bomber. I think everybody was kind of proud of it, the fact that we accumulated so much in such a short time. April 6, 1943. We all watched it fly in. A B-17 bomber landed at Kent County Airport. It was quite a thing to get that many students together to walk out to the airport and see that plane. Its name? Spirit of South Eye. Painted prominently on the fuselage. These are kids, their hearts and souls are wrapped up in what they had accomplished. They really believed that this bomber was going to be the difference in the war. Nobody knew what happened to it. 47 years would pass. In 1990, South High student Robert Tuffelmeyer was tired of not knowing. So he called in the big guy, and the big guy for South High School uh, alums is Gerald R. Ford. Gerald Ford was a 1931 graduate of South High. He was a very loyal alum. The president got the Department of Defense on it. The bomber was used for training. <sighs> So it never went to war. It never fought a battle. October 1st, 1944. It had taken off from Lockbourne Air Force Base. They were doing a night vision training. They were to fly from Columbus to Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama. On its way back, the pilot got lost in the fog. He had no option but to fly around till he ran out of gas and then ditch the plane. All six members bailed and survived. But it crashed in Meadows of Dan, Virginia. In this field of trees. To this day, pieces of the plane are still being found. Isn't this fun? And they have the tail number. October 1st, 2018. What better day than the 74th anniversary of the crash? South High alumni yeah. from near oh. and far. Good afternoon, everyone. Gathered at that Virginia field. It's really a thrill to be here at this moment. To help dedicate the crash site. They were shocked to learn that they had crashed in Meadows of Dan. Revealing more than just a monument. They showed the spirit of South High remains strong. South will be true. And the memory of the bomber that once bore the same name. We will give to you. Thanks to the efforts of the students who bought it. It was something for, for a high school to do that. Will never be forgotten. The alumni at South are amazing. Grand Rapids South High School closed for good in 1968. 50 years later, former teachers, coaches, and alumni still gather monthly at various Grand Rapids locations to reminisce. That goes to show the spirit of South High may have started out as a campaign to buy a plane, but it evolved into something that refuses to fade. If you know of it. So that's the story of the Buy a Bomber program in South High School. I thank you all for being so attentive, and um, must, I would be very willing to take questions if you have some. Yes, sir. Um, Arlie Dalton told me that the military came in and took all the big stuff, and his grandpa had to sign a paper that it was okay to leave the other stuff. A lot of the townspeople came and took things, um, but since they didn't talk about it, a lot of their children have just thrown this stuff away because they don't know what it is. 
And um, so we're, we're kind of on a mini campaign to get people to, uh, to look in their barns and their garages and see if they've got something that they think came from it to, to turn it in so we could try to verify it. But, yes, sir. Is that not? What? Try it again. He had, to, he had to turn it on back there. Do you know how many people participated in the purchase of the stamps and the bonds? I have uh, no idea. Instigated by the, you know, by the students. By the kids. I, I have no idea. Um, people always ask me, who don't, aren't from Grand Rapids, oh, this must have been a wealthy school. And I said, no, not at all. Um, but you have to understand the times. Um, everything was rationed. You, you couldn't buy, you know, you were encouraged not to drive your cars. You, well, you only had, uh, you had to have a, a stamp for gas. And um, so you couldn't, you couldn't drive your cars. You were told the rubber for tires was needed for the war effort. Um, you know, everything was rationed, even clothes and shoes and boots and everything. So, plus the flip side of that was everybody was working. They went to the factories. I've had gentlemen tell me I never saw my dad because he was working, you know, seven days a week, 12-hour days. And women were working, too. So, suddenly, these people had all this money, and there was nothing they could spend it on. And, um, but... Most of these families came out of the Great Depression, so they were skeptical of banks. But so the kids had to convince them that to invest in America, that they had to buy these bonds. And so, uh, so people came forward and did it. Now, that makes it a little bit easier to understand, but still, it's an extraordinary amount of money that, uh, that, that they were able to, uh, to pull together. Yes, ma'am. Is it on? Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, you had a hunch about the camera and photography and the war and the connection, how it provided, the camera provided the expanse of information for the war, but the war gave back. And the language of photography is, um, is from the war. When we go out on a photo shoot, when we go shoot a picture, it came from the war. And when we wanted to enlarge a picture, we, we would call it a blow up, or we're going to go blow up the picture. It all came from the war, so that's the relationship. Oh, wonderful. So you were right. Thank you. <laughs> it's been verified. Yay. She, she's all right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Diane up here. By the way, are there any South High alumni in the room? Come on, Don, raise your hand. My brother's here. Anybody else? There were some that were out there who came to talk to me, but I had to leave. Okay. Okay, so thank you. That was fascinating. My question is, what, do you know anything about what happened to the plane they bought with the $75,000? Um, strangely enough, uh, I found a crash report for that one, and um, this one crashed on October 1st, and that one, um, shoot, what's it called? Okay, you pilots out here, when, it, when a plane tips and it spins on the ground and it breaks off, I forget what that's called. Not a cartwheel, it didn't go over. Anyways, it, um, it, they called it a crash, and it crashed, I think it was September 1st and, uh, of, of 1944. It was, it may, no, it, no, 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 no. I think it was September 27th. No one's asked me that question, so I better look it up so I know for sure. But it was in within a couple days of when, when the other one went down, and I thought that was unusual. I thought it was interesting. I don't know what it means, but I thought it was interesting. Where? I'm sorry? Where? Where? It was at uh, one of the Air Force bases. It was a, a, it, a pilot was in training, and he was supposed to go from one from one um, runway to the other, and he went too fast, a loop. He did a ground loop, and it broke the wing off. 
<clears throat> so any other questions? Is a movie in the making, or don't you know? <laughs> you know, every time I speak, and even after at the end of that news clip, Channel 13, the, the other two reporters that came on, they said, it sounds like a movie to me. And um, no one's approached me yet, but I have optioned a couple of screenplays before, mm -hmm. so I'm trying to figure out. See, the trick is being able to tell both sides of the story. Oh, okay. And um, in fact, the, the book out there, She Started It All, is a historical fiction version, which could be the basis for a screenplay because I, to put that together, I had to figure out um, where to set it. And I set it in Meadows of Dan in a classroom and mm -hmm. reports that kids had to give one on, and the boy finds the Grand Rapids story and the girl finds the Meadows of Dan story. Well, I go to the Traverse City Film Festival almost every year and Michael Moore might want to do this. <laughs> you should check it out. <laughs> it would make a wonderful <coughs> film. It would, it would. Thank you so much. Does he go to that film festival? He started it. He started it. Oh, okay. You can talk to me afterwards, I'll be here. I can talk for hours, so, you know, I kept thinking, how long did I speak, because. <laughs> Thank you, this was very interesting. You, you had mentioned the possibility or a rumor that there had been a crash on another date with 11 killed. Was that ever tied <coughs> to this event, or was that a totally No, it had different? nothing to do with this event. You have to understand where Meadows of Dan is located. It's, it's in a direct path from some of the bases in, um, in North Carolina going to uh, Norfolk, Norfolk, Virginia, where the other bases were. So they had planes flying over all the time, and the kids were always um, arguing over what kind of plane just flew over. In fact, when I wrote this story, a couple of gentlemen came up to me and said, I thought it was a B-24. Are you sure? You know, and so, you know, they, they were still arguing about what kind of plane it was, especially after they heard I wrote this story. And there are people that grew up there that don't believe this story. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much.